About one month ago, I arrived at the National Museum of American History as one of this year's Lemelson Center Fellows. My goal was to perform the research I need in order to complete my dissertation, Intangible Inventions, A History of Software Patenting in the United States. I have worked with a wide array of documents and objects in your care, ranging from the archival collections on video games and microchips to the trade literature collected in your library and the computer documentation housed in your treasure troves on the fifth floor. I have been writing furiously during my time here, and I am very grateful for the opportunity that you have given me. Today, I would like to share with you one part of Intangible Inventions. I will draw from chapter six of my dissertation on the so-called computer hobbyists of the 1970s. These were the computer enthusiasts who gathered at community centers, hotel lobbies, and university classrooms across the country in order to tinker with machines, discuss and exchange computer programs, and carve a place for computing in their daily lives. Often inspired by the countercultural impulses that swept across the nation in the 1960s, many hobbyists aimed to use computers in order to enhance how people lived their lives and learned new things. I will argue that the hobbyists' cheap periodicals facilitated the creation of a moral economy for computer programs, that is, rules that regulated access to programs, their authorship, and knowledge transfer among the hobbyists. This moral economy was grounded on both the peculiar conception of the nature of software and the division of labor that determined how hobbyists should collaborate with one another. This argument illustrates two of the contributions that Intangible Inventions makes to the historiographies of computing and intellectual property law. First, I contend that notions of software as an intellectual property did not emerge exclusively from the top down when courts and Congress issued new frameworks with which to understand and control the legal ownership of software. On the contrary, these notions have often emerged from the makers and users of computer programs. Second, ideas about software as an intellectual property or as a technology that should be free from it often carried with them what I call ontologies of software, that is, conceptions of the nature of software as a technology. These ontologies were grounded not on the technical specifications of any programs, but on the qualities of software as an invention and as a commodity that their proponents envisioned. Today, I will proceed in four stages. That's a summary of the argument up there. First, I will provide an overview of the main actors that I will be discussing today. Second, I will address some of the conflicts regarding the intellectual property protection of programs that unfolded uh, in the cheap periodicals that the hobbyists shared. Then, I will discuss the ontology of software that informed how prominent hobbyists made, discussed, and shared computer programs. And I will end by sketching the hobbyists' moral economy. So, we begin with the overview. In the 1970s, Robert Albrecht was one of the most recognizable computer hobbyists in California. He was a former engineer for Controlled Data Corporation and Honeywell, and he had taught computing at public schools for over one decade. His experience as an educator had shaped his vision of computers as tools that could enhance how people lived their lives. In his publications, he showed an increasing focus on transforming computers into everyday objects with, with, any, with which anyone could engage. In 1969, for example, he published a book called Computer Methods in Mathematics on using a programming language called BASIC as an instructional tool in high school math. The next year, he published a less formal volume uh, entitled Teach Yourself BASIC, a how-to guide for amateur programmers. Then, in 1972, he published the humorously titled work, My Computer Likes Me When I Speak Basic, a book written with what Albrecht described as an, quote, easygoing conversational style that introduces basic to young or old. Here, right there, you see the cover of this later volume. It features a, a happy man and a computer who likes him. And the, the printout on top of the computer reads, right on. <laughs> Albrecht was the founding member of a newspaper called the People's Computer Company, or PCC. Here you see the cover of the newspaper's first issue on the left and the table of contents on the right. 
The top of the cover reads, computers are mostly used against people instead of for people, used to control people instead of to free them. Time to change all that. We need a people's computer company. That's the dramatic uh, bubble letters coming out of the sun. By the mid-1970s, the newspaper had reached several thousand subscribers, and it had become one of the primary sources of information for anyone who wished to personalize their experience with computers. It printed several articles on programming, reviews of hardware and software, and even full, simple programs written in BASIC. The PCC cost $1 per issue for people who ordered fewer than 10 issues at a time, and 30 cents per issue for orders of 100 or more. It was a very cheap periodical. Alongside Albrecht at the People's Computer Company was Dennis Allison. Holding a bachelor's degree in physics, Allison worked at the Stanford Research Institute, or SRI. His job was to handle the radio equipment that tracked the flight of military rockets. While at SRI, Allison had grown interested in computing and he had started writing software compilers and several other programming tools for his personal use. He had even developed a version of BASIC for mainframes called InterAccess BASIC. Allison became the president of the local chapter of the Association of Computing Machinery, ACM, one of the major professional organizations in the field, and he had met Albrecht during an ACM conference held in San Francisco. Now, Drawn into the countercultural impulse that had swept the nation since the 1960s, Allison and Albrecht conceived of the PCC as a force to free computers from the grasp of the military industrial academic complex. Here, you see one of the recurring illustrations in the PCC, depicting protesters from all walk of life supporting the PCC and promoting BASIC as, quote, the people's language, unquote. The woman on the far right-hand side is holding a sign that reads, use computers for the people, not against them. And the man on the bottom left holds a sign that reads, no more Fortran, uh, in, in <laughs> protest of the very popular programming language. Um, in the mid-1970s, computer hobbyists were especially interested in a machine called the Altair 8800, a microcomputer released in 1975 by an Albuquerque firm called MITS. Microinstrumentation and Telemetry Systems. Here you see a photograph of the magazine's uh, machine's announcement in Popular Electronics. And here is one of my favorite periodical images housed here at the museum, a cover of Computer Notes celebrating the Altair's success. Clients could choose to buy a disassemble Altair for less than $450, or they could pay around $620 for an assembled one. MITS and hobbyists would soon start developing new taper, paper tape readers, RAM cards, and interfaces to connect to teletypes. But at first, the machine could only be programmed by flicking the switches on its front. You can see the, the black switches on the bottom of the front panel. Uh, and its only outputs were the flashing lights above the switches, the little red dots. Altair users could, use, could get most of their software from a library of low-cost programs that MITS maintained. It included systems programs and games and basic data processing applications. Each program cost $2, and it could range in length from a few dozen lines of code from to dozens of pages of it. In order to keep a steady supply of programs, MIT sponsored a monthly software contest, overseen by Bill Gates, actually. Um, the firm would screen and test the submissions, and it would make all the acceptable programs available for purchase on its software library. Now, no portion of the $2 would reach the program's creators as a condition for submission was to grant MITS permission to sell their work. In exchange, programmers received a $10 credit that they could apply when they purchased software from MITS. The winners of the monthly contest would receive an additional credit ranging from $15 to $50, and then each year, MITS would select the authors of the best programs and award them credits of $250 to $1,000, depending on the type of program that they had written. This photograph here, uh, it's in your fifth floor, actually. It shows one of the earlier announcements of the software contests on the bottom left, explaining the logistics I just outlined. MITS relied heavily on the use of licensing agreements in order to prevent the unauthorized distribution of its software. 
The museum holds this beautifully preserved copy of one such agreement. This is a photograph of its first page. It reads, attached is a software program license agreement. If you, right there. If you plan to order of or have ordered software from MITS, please sign the attached agreement and return it to MITS immediately. We will begin shipment of software as soon as we have your signed agreement in house. Indeed, this document was a prerequisite for software acquisition. Even if a client had paid all the fees, no programs should leave MITS unless a licensing agreement had been filed. The license program that users obtained encompassed tapes and listings in machine-readable or printed form, as well as any updates or portions thereof. Any users who wish to distribute the program to authorized parties such as employees or subsidiaries would need to include the following proprietary rights disclosure. This software is the property of MITS Incorporated and has been supplied by MITS to the licensee pursuant to a program license agreement. This software is furnished following to the following restrictions. It shall not be reproduced, copied, or used in whole or in part on equipment other than the designated equipment with which it was furnished without the express written permission. Like many other firms, MITS favored these licensing agreements over any other kind of intellectual property protection. For this firm in particular, the income generated by programs worth $2 each and intended for a few thousand users did not merit investing in the acquisition of and defense of patents and copyrights, which could often take several years. In contrast, however, hobbyists did not resort to these formalities when acquiring software from one another as many of them prefer, prefer to collaborate and exchange their work freely. Consider, for example, Allison and Albrecht's vision for the development of the language called Tiny Basic. In 1975, the two programmers published a sketch of what they hoped Tiny Basic would look like. Uh, it was a version of Basic for the Altair 8800. And soon, the two programmers started to receive letters with fully fleshed out versions written by hobbyists all based on their sketch. Allison and Albrecht were so pleased with this response that they decided to start publishing a newsletter dedicated to programming in Tiny Basic. They gave the magazine a very, very peculiar name, Dr. Dobbs Journal of Basic Calisthenics and Orthodontia. <laughs> oh dear indeed. The first part of the name, Dr. Dobbs, is a contraction of the names uh, Dennis and Bob. The second part was a tongue-in-cheek rephrasing of their mission to publish programs that would first run quickly, hence the word calisthenics, and second, not consume too much memory or overbite, hence the word <laughs> orthodontia. Here, you see the cover of the first volume of Dr. Dobbs. Um, they're a joy to sift through, they're wonderful. So now, with this in mind, I would like to turn to the hobbyist conflicts with computer programmers, paying special attention to their periodicals. Dr. Dobbs was dedicated to the study and dissemination of programs written in Tiny Basic. But Albrecht was interested in exploring other programming languages on which hobbyists could rely. Basic was not enough. In this spirit, he wrote to a programmer called Calvin N. Moores. By the 1970s, Morse had received some financial success as founder and president of Rockford Research, a Massachusetts-based software company. He had also secured several patents for a punch card-based information retrieval system called Zato Coding, which he had developed in the late 1940s. More recently, he had become especially involved with the development of a new programming language called TRAC, text reckoning and compiling language which he had conceived and financed on his own. In an effort to control the language and its name, he had secured a trademark over the name track and copyrights over several key texts involved in its creation, including all the manuals and uh, any code that he had written. Moore's was also an amateur commentator on intellectual property law. He had taught himself enough about copyright law to correspond with some of the best known intellectual property lawyers in the nation. He personally requested materials from prominent scholars and practitioners, offering his own views on their works whenever he felt compelled to do so. His requests and commentary were very formal, 
detailed and very well informed. He wrote his letters with great care and he expected the same from his correspondence. Now, Albrecht's short handcrafted note was the opposite of what Moore's expected from his correspondence. Shown here, it was written in informal prose and it featured a cartoon question mark and a few typos. It reads, what should I and readers of the PCC know about track? In case you've never heard of PCC, I'm sending you copies. We have formed a home computer club of 50 to 100 people who are building Intel 8008 or 8080 based home computers and PCC has about 1700 subscribers, possibly 3000 readers, mostly teachers, kids, hobbyists, squiggly question mark, Bob. Moore's already knew that hobbyists did not share his own preoccupation with the intellectual property protection of software. And he responded with a lengthy letter that included several attachments describing both track and the legal protections that he had arranged for it. He explained that he had developed the language using his own time and money, and that he continued to support its development using his own funds. Recently, he had started to market processors for it, uh, <clears throat> through timesharing outlets and license agreements. But he and Rockford Research continued to be what he called a very small operation. Morse explained to Albrecht that the hobby market posed him an important and perhaps insur insurmountable challenge. The cost of computers was decreasing very rapidly, so more people than ever were buying and using them. This meant that software was becoming increasingly important, but at the same time, it meant that he would, quote, do what he had to do to make a living in this business, unquote. This included being careful not to disclose too much information with good reason, working to secure trademarks and copyrights for promising languages such as track, and being willing to take people to federal courts for committing what he considered piracy. Should he fail to take these measures or to explain clearly the legal rights he had obtained, Morse told Albrecht, the hobbyists could destroy Track's future. Overwhelmed by this response, Albrecht set aside Morse correspondence and decided to address it later. He started to suspect that the programmer's fear of engaging with him was symptomatic of a bigger problem that characterized the relationships between independent hobbyists and corporate programmers. Indeed, two programmers, Bill Gates and Paul Allen, had recently found themselves in the situation that Morse had been so careful to avoid. Based at a small Albuquerque firm called Microsoft, they hadn't deleted the dash yet, uh, Allen and Gates had developed a version of BASIC for the Altair. The Altair BASIC. Right there. Copies of Altair BASIC were meant to retail for about $500 each, and Gates and Allen had worked out a deal with MITS to receive uh, between $30 and $60 for each copy of the program sold. I'll go over their story very quickly in case you don't know it. In April of 1975, Mitz had sent Gates's program on a tour across the West Coast in the Mitzmobile, uh, shown here. A camper van that Mitz had launched earlier that month. The van carried an Altair 8800, copies of Altair Basic, a teletype, and a printer. It would make its way from Texas to California, uh, and it would enable MITS to set up computer seminars at hotels and motels across the country. Each seminar cost $9.75 to attend, and they usually had over 200 participants. Hobbyists were welcome to nominate their hometowns for addition into the van's tour schedule, and MITS had vowed to add into the van's tour schedule any town where the hobbyists had enlisted at least 75 people to attend the seminar. What happened when the van reached Palo Alto has become one of the most prominent tales among professional and amateur historians of computing alike. One of the tapes containing Gates's program was lost and it did not reappear until several weeks later in the hands of one of the hobbyists at another hobby group called the Homebrew Computer Club. That same day, a box containing 50 copies of the tape appeared at the club only to be ambushed by hobbyists who left it empty within a few seconds. Enraged, Gates sent a letter in 1976 to most hobby journals. The letter was entitled, An Open Letter to Hobbyists, and it has become a key document in the history of computing, evidence of the fact that software makers in the 1970s 
face the challenge of creating a market for their products by selling to a group of potential users who shared their programs with very few restrictions. At the core of Gates's letter was his condemnation of how hobbyists shared programs with one another. He explained that he and his colleagues had been working on BASIC for almost a year, and that, oh, sorry, yeah, there we go, and that the value of the computer time they had used surpassed $40,000. He suspected that less than 10% of the users of BASIC had actually paid for the program, and he estimated that his royalties at this point amounted to less than $2 per hour. The problem, Gates wrote, is that most of you steal your software. In his view, hobbyists assume that, quote, hardware, hardware must be paid for, but software is something to share, unquote. And they gave no consideration as to whether people who worked on the software got paid. Most directly, Gates told the hobbyists, the thing you do is theft. Now, certainly hobby club meetings served as spaces wherein software was freely distributed and reproduced very quickly. However, the responses to Gates's letter suggest that this sharing should not be construed as their universal embrace of the idea that the market should be bypassed altogether. On the contrary, some hobbyists regarded the, regretted that this unauthorized reproduction was taking place, and others viewed their sharing practices as one of the factors that determines the value of a program in the free market for computing. Consider, for example, a response to the letter by Michael Hayes, an employee at a firm called MNH Electronics. Hayes told Gates that he should not blame the hobbyists for his own inadequate marketing of Altair Basic, since the program's value is determined by the market, not by its makers. Moreover, Hayes wrote, you gave it away, none stole it from you. Now you're asking for software welfare so you can give more away. If $2 per hour is all you got for your efforts, then $2 per hour is what they're worth on the free market. You can either change your product or change your way of selling it, if you feel it'll bring more money. It's too bad you didn't get the profit from your efforts that Mitz did from theirs, but that's your fault, not theirs or the hobbyists. You underpriced your product. The original has only the underlining. I bold it for you. Um, Perhaps Gay Hayes misunderstood the conditions under which the hobbyists had required Gates's program. But his point was that selling and marketing were as important as coding. He thanked Gates for creating Altair Basic, and he explained that Mitch should be equally grateful. After all, without his software, the Altair 8800 would be uh, just a computer that, quote, none would have touched except as a frustrating novelty item, unquote. Still, Hayes believed that Gates was blaming everyone but himself for his own lack of business savvy. To increase future profits, Hayes told Gates, you had better stop writing code for a minute and think a little harder about your market and how you are going to sell it. Now, Gates's letter prompted Albrecht finally to make public his experiences dealing with Moore's. In charge of writing and publishing a response to Morse was the new editor of Dr. Dobbs, Jim Warren. Warren was a teacher and a programmer. He had arrived at California in the mid-1960s, and he was drawn to the countercultural scene and places such as Berkeley and San Francisco. Now he worked as a computer programmer at the Stanford Medical Center, where he had learned to use PDP-8 machines. He took a class at San Francisco State University taught by Albrecht, and the two men shared a vision of computers as machines that could teach and entertain anyone interested in them. Soon after the two men became friends, Warren had become an essential member of the Dr. Dobbs' team. Warren's note in Dr. Dobbs, entitled, I love this title, Copyright Mania, It's Mine, It's Mine, and You Can't Play With It, <laughs> mocked Morris's views on proprietary software to protest the accusation that most hobbyists stole their software. Warren believed that Morse had been unnecessarily aggressive and protective. Instead of answering the hobbyist questions, Morse had sent them a price list for his software and documentation, an appendix disclosing tracks copyright protection in the name's trademark registration, a copy of his policy on licensing, 
a description of his willingness to go to court, and an assortment of articles about his own views on the legal protection of software. Even the price list that Morris had included had on it a copy of the copyright sign. <laughs> In the lighthearted spirit of Dr. Dobbs, Warren explained that if Morris's package of materials was any indicator, track must have been, quote, at least a registered trademark and probably patented, copyrighted, and marked with infrared dyed to boot, unquote. Just to be safe, Warren continued, it would perhaps be best not to include in Dr. Dobbs the titles of the articles that Morse had written, just in case the programmer decided to sue them for printing the titles without permission. In Warren's view, the programmers like Morse were just creating what he called, quote, an incredible teapot tempest, unquote. I now turn to a discussion of the nature and sale of software. Warren thought that the relationship between hardware and software in the hobbyist minds was similar to that between a photocopier and a book. Allow me to share his rationale. Imagine that a publisher decides to sell a reference book to users of Xerox brand photocopiers, and that her sales tactic is to place copies of the book next to any Xerox machines she can find. Above each pile of books, she would place a sign that says, if you want a copy of this book, you must send us $350. If you are holding the book in your hands and are standing in front of the Xerox machine, would you go through the trouble of writing a check or money order, mailing it to the publisher, and waiting for the book to come in the mail? Well, perhaps you are. But Warren believed that in this case, regardless of how marvelous the reference book may be, no one is likely to pay that much money for something they could photocopy on their own. Warren believed that in this situation, there were only two ways of getting people to pay anything. Either to reduce the price of the book to something so low that spending money made more, that spending money made more sense than spending time making photocopies, or to sell the book for a high price, but only to the manufacturer and not to the photocopy machine users. The same was true in his mind of software. If people such as Morse and Gates wanted to make money out of software, they should either charge very little and depend on volume sales, or sell their products for a high price to the only market within which they can keep unauthorized reproduction in check, namely hardware manufacturers. In the end, Warren argued, software should just be like Dr. Dobbs. A subscription for this magazine cost only $10 per year, this meant that with a healthy enough readership of whom he called non-profit-making hobbyists, Dr. Dobbs would not run into financial trouble, where an even, even offered free publicity to any software makers for microcomputers that would adopt the pricing strategy that he proposed. This, in his view, was, quote, the right track in this new and exciting area. The programs that most approached Warren's vision for software were written in Tiny Basic the language to which Albrecht and Allison had dedicated Dr. Dobbs. Indeed, Warren shared Allison's unusual understanding of the relationships between programs written in Tiny Basic and the machines that ran them. Allow me to give you a little background. By the mid-1970s, ideas about the relationships between hardware and software had taken on many forms. In Intangible Inventions, I show how they varied from place to place and from firm to firm and from the patent office all the way up to the Supreme Court. The historical actors who studied these relationships disagreed with one another on several fundamental matters, but most of them shared one important assumption, that software, whatever that may be, is something get, that gets put in a computer. Even prominent lawyers and programmers who believed that some aspect of each program came into existence outside of a machine believed also that software was at least in part internal to computers. Programs worked from the inside out in ways that triggered transformations in the machines that ran them. In contrast, Allison envisioned the relationships between hardware and software as a series of mediations best understood as the layers of an onion. Here, you see one of Allison's illustrations of this relationship. The onion's outside layer, the skin, was the application program written in Tiny Basic. 
its core was the machine that would run the program, perhaps the Altair 8800. The middle layers of the onion were sequences of programs called interpreters, that is, programs that execute other programs without requiring full translations into machine language. In other words, a given program in Tiny Basic, the outermost layer of an onion, had its own interpreter, the second most uh, outermost layer. However, this interpreter itself was a program, so it too had an interpreter, and that's the third outmost layer. This process would continue going inwards until a final interpreter connected its predecessor to the machine itself, which stood at the very, very center of the onion. The picture of the onion was meant to simplify the repetitive layering of interpretations that connected a program with the machine that ran it. It was a complement to Allison's own intentionally verbose and confusing, confusing description of the process, which explained that that which is interpreting the interpreter, interpreting the interpreter, interpreting basic, is in fact interpreted. In this metaphor, the onion's layers, that is, the connection between the machine and its users, were the software. Securing a patent or a copyright over this software would therefore amount to controlling the layers of technologies that mediated between humans and machines. Certainly, Allison believed any such intellectual property protections would carry with them financial implications, as hobbyists may find themselves having to pay more than a few dollars in order to obtain the software they wanted or needed. However, at the same time, these protections ran afoul of his missions to liberate computers from government centers and academic contexts and to place them in people's hands. Intellectual property protections were yet, were yet one more form of control that stood in the way of this liberation, as they could potentially negate a person's ability to interact freely with a machine. These protections certainly may be more intangible than other forms of control, as they manifested themselves as patents, copyright registrations, and licensing agreements, and not as huge mainframes and the locked buildings that housed them. Still, in order to use the onion's core, users needed to control its layers. So now, I will move on to how the hobbyists made these onions. Like Allison, Warren believed that software had never had a more exciting present or a more promising future. The spread of programs and code among hobbyists had shown him that when software is free, or at least cheap enough that it's easier to pay for it than to duplicate it, then it won't be stolen. At the core of the hobbyists' activities was a division of labor that Warren called the chief programmer team approach. This was a fast-paced hierarchical division of labor in which people with different skill levels shared everything through cheap periodicals. It consisted of having whom he called an experienced pro craft the overall design of the program and outline an implementation strategy through widely distributed journals such as Dr. Dobbs. Then, the people he called the more experienced amateurs would complete the necessary heck work, that's his term, which they found exciting and which the experienced pro would find tedious anyway. The journal-mediated communication between the pro and the amateurs would create what he called a symbiotic effort. And it would, it would disclose the knowledge that everyone else would need to design their own programs and perform bug tests. In return for this knowledge, readers would find a way to disclose any improvements they created, perhaps by publishing their work in the same issues wherein the professionals and the amateurs were still publishing their thoughts. This process made programming labor a form of playing, not working, and it ensured that everyone would share in, quote, the amazing amount of good stuff, unquote, that they produced together. This is not to say that Warren believed that money should never be exchanged. On the contrary, he celebrated the fact that an allied hobby group, the Community Computer Center in Menlo Park, California, had created a small business called the Program Repository and Tape Duplication Facility. Any programmer who wished to contribute their programs to the public domain could do so by forwarding paper tapes to the CCC. 
the facility would con distribute the programs, and makers would publish any important documentation in Dr. Dobbs and direct any potential users to the CCC. There were no membership fees required to request the materials from the facility, and the nominal prices included nothing more than the duplication and mailing costs. The facility's low prices and appealing selection made it an overnight success and a common free advertiser in Dr. Dobbs. Software was priced by weight at $1 per ounce, and a program's final price was computed by the weight of the tape used to store it after the program had been punched into it. This ensured that customers were paying only for the tape that they were receiving and not for the little paper discs that had been removed during the punching. Postage was 50 cents for any orders that totaled less than $5 and $1 for all other orders. This pricing scheme had allowed hobbyists to access the facility's 50 different programs. The cheapest programs cost about $2 each. They included pattern matching and word guessing games. And the most expensive ones were up to $20 each, but that was very expensive. And they were primarily business applications and simple statistical tools. For the rest of the 1970s, Dr. Dobbs and many of the hobbyists who follow it embraced Warren's vision. Warren promised that low-cost system software interpreters, compilers, assemblers, games, and really any other program would always be welcome at Dr. Dobbs and at the facility. The journal would always encourage users to test out the programs printed in its pages or made available through the facility. Moreover, it would hold an unwavering stance against firms that hired people such as Morrison Gates who would, quote, peddle software to unsuspecting customers for a healthy profit, unquote. Thus, for at least a few years, Dr. Dobbs had transformed into what leading hobbyists hoped software would become, a low-cost and high-volume publication made by computer enthusiasts for anyone who would join them. To conclude, I would like to give you a sense of how this work fits into my dissertation. My study of the hobbyists enables me to bring human beings into a discussion that has traditionally focused on the text of the law. Intangible Inventions ends in the 1980s among the legal, commercial, and philosophical problems born out of the patent protection for personal computing technologies. Legal scholarship on software patenting in this period has normally focused on the role that a key Supreme Court decision, Diamond v. Deere, played in changing the law of software patenting and its philosophical underpinnings by ruling that an industrial process controlled by a computer program was patent eligible, the story normally goes, the Supreme Court created a new era in the history of software patenting. In contrast, I contend that software patent change, patenting changed radically in the 1980s, not just because new legal rationales started to take hold in the courts, but also because new groups of people became interested in addressing the commercial, technical, and legal problems brought about by personal computing. Indeed, as the market for personal computing started to grow, the meaning of the word software started to change. The, ability, the availability of off-the-shelf or free computer programs and electronic components brought with it a new vision of who, of who the potential intellect, intellectual property infringers were. The concerns of computing firms from the 1940s to the 1970s namely that other firms would steal their products, became secondary to the concern that users, from business people to children, would find ways of obtaining software products for free. Indeed, everyday users became the new potential pirates when they brought computers into their homes. In this context, which I explore in chapter seven, after what you just heard, the computer hobbyists mattered, not just because their work helped to shape several cultures of personal computing, but also because stories about them informed how programmers, programmers, managers, and lawyers responded to this new age of piracy. So thank you very much. Questions and discussion are welcome. Oh, I thought that was a great talk. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, you, you brought in the concept of the 
kind of ontology of software, and so I wanted to start there. And the way you presented it was very much the an internal, in other words, the the leaders, the writers of the software, kind of, and in their trade press, in the kind of magazines, fanzines, whatever the term is, right? Mm -hmm. That they're kind of engaging in it in that onion-like model. And I guess I just wonder, even in that period, before the Supreme Court's ruling, isn't there some other vision of the ontology out there? In other words, other consumers or intellectual property lawyers, the ones who eventually get this to the Supreme Court, where clearly a totally a somewhat different ontology holds sway around defining it. So I'm wondering, even in that moment, what was the outside market thinking as opposed to these kind of people discussing amongst themselves? That's a great question. Uh, so in my dissertation, I use the history of intellectual property as a way of accounting for the history of ontologies of software. So in fact, from the late 1940s up until the mid-1980s, uh, disagreements about how and if software constitutes an intellectual property were often grounded on disagreements on what software is. Uh, I have an article coming out, uh, I'm gonna put a plug for it, uh, in the Annals of the History of Computing called Contested Ontologies of Software uh, that basically explores this issue. This issue that in order to think about the intellectual property protection of computer programs, lawyers, programmers, and judges were actually crafting stances on the nature of software. Uh, so yes, it's, it's one of the biggest themes that I have in my dissertation. And that's why I love the hobbyist's onion, because it's the only vegetable I have. Uh, yeah. I was wondering what, how much of the hobbyist might have been influenced by the university settings. You know, in the, in the 60s, they were exchanging programs. You know, I, mean, I was just normal. Like, you know, they would develop space for it. It was sort of another university adventure, all these software being exchanged. So, of course, that's the culture of computers at the time. So when we get to, of course, Users, they thought, well, okay, this is acceptable, so how much is that, is that, is that correlation that one can make? Or? Mm -hmm. um, the answer is a lot. So a lot of how the hobbyists thought about sharing software was influenced by the universities. And that's for two reasons. The first one is that, you know, this, this countercultural impulse from the 60s and 70s was especially heavy in campuses across the country. Um, the other reason, and this one is, a, is, a, is perhaps my favorite one, is that universities had IBM machines, and users of IBM machines had access to the program sharing community called Share. And if you look at the way that Shares describes programs, you're going to find a lot of parallels, including uh, to, to parallels to how the computers, uh, the hobbyists, describe their programs, including this sort of layering effect that um, that programs have between users and machines. So it, it's a lot, both technological and cultural. Yeah. yeah. I had two really kind of quick questions, I guess. Well, maybe at least the first one is, so you talked a lot about liberation. It was a word you used throughout your talk, and I was kind of curious if Ted Nelson, your hollow figure into your story, seeing as the Altair came out the same year that uh, Computer Lib was published. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I was curious if Ted Nelson would figure in your narrative since it's around the same time as... Um, what he, ha he doesn't yet. He hasn't shown up in any of the periodicals I've studied. But perhaps as I expand the scope, I'm not done with chapter six yet. <laughs> right. And the other question I have is more methodological, which mm -hmm. was um, when you're talking about moral economy, are you, how are you sort of working with that? Is it sort of like a Rob Kohler-esque interpretation of it? Or are you sort of going back to E.P. Thompson? How are you setting that up? I'm uh, taking it in the sense that Kohler used it in Lords of the Fly as sort of the, you know, uh, for, to broaden the audience of the discussion here. Uh, instead of thinking about, no, sorry. Kohler wrote a book called Lords of the Fly about how Thomas Hunt Morgan uh, had designed access to the flies that he kept in his fly lab. And what Kohler says is that the people who used these flies had rules and regulations that dictated what they could expect from each other, both in terms of intellectual transmission and in terms of exchange of flies. And that's the sense that I am using the term moral economy. I'm not going all the way back to E.P. Thompson. Um, I'm, I'm sticking to the Kohler sense. Yes. I just want to thank you again for a great talk. I want to pick up on the first question. So, I mean, could, could you articulate kind of what those 
So for your hobbyists that you're talking about, they have their own sort of moral economy and how they um, share software or what, what they think the right way to do it is. And, I mean, how would, could you, what, so this is not very well, did they codify it? And if they didn't, can you codify it? Like, what were those rules? They codify it. The answer to that is no. Uh, that like sort of creating a top-down, uh, creating a top-down requirement of how to work ran a little bit against their their, their bigger philosophies. But it but it was uh, but this this sort of chief programmer team approach that I described it was uh, to Warren to several other hobbyists it was an assumption of how things should work. So instead of saying, these are the rules that you must follow to be a hobbyist, they would say, well, you're a hobbyist. I'm kind of hoping this is what you're going to do in order to fit in. Yeah, but it's certainly not. It, it certainly wasn't codified at all. Uh, and I don't think I would codify it myself. But were there sort of tacit understandings like, you know, we don't pay for software? Like, I mean, could you, could you even say what some of those sort of tenets were? I mean, did they believe that they should pay anything for software? Who, I mean, what were the conditions under which you share it? I mean, like how are, I mean, could, could you take something that's hard to codify that they wouldn't codify because that wasn't their nature? And sort of, do you have any sense of what the sort of unwritten? Okay, yeah. So, so for example, uh, one one tricky one is that it might be very easy to assume that hobbyists really would not pay anything for a program except for the price of the tape as the facility would distribute it. But that was not exactly what they were saying. And, 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 and several of them shared the assumption that if any profit whatsoever was included in the price of a program, it was minuscule and almost undetectable. So that was one of those unwritten rules. Um, the other unwritten rule is uh, major communications should be uh, to take place through these cheap periodicals that have uh, sort of a wide appeal. And that anything that you do based on what you learn from those periodicals should go in the periodicals. It should go back to it with an acknowledgment of where you took your information. Uh, if we push the story a little further than from what I uh, am speaking about it here, these are, some of the, these are some of the tenets that would later become sort of free software movement or open source software. So many, many, many of the visions of software as a liberated good stemmed from this moral economy that I'm, uh, that I'm seeing here. If you do want to see it codified, it would, the best one would be in the 80s with Stallman's new manifesto. That would probably be the best uh, document that summarizes how things should work, but that's a little later. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if at this time that you're writing about, were there any parallels going on in other industries regarding um, intangible assets or the sort of thing we see now with theft of music and, and so on? Or was this just a, a unique industry? And if so, why, why was it unique? Why wasn't this happening elsewhere when there was this counterculture movement, as you say, throughout the nation? So intangible assets, that's... That's a big one. And in fact, uh, one of my other chapters sort of tells a parallel story that's going on in uh, courts around the country regarding whether or not software should constitute an intangible asset for the purposes of tax law. So certainly there, there is a much, much bigger story still relying on software. Whether or not software was unique was actually very contentious, um, especially at the courts and at feral hearings where people were saying, no, look, this software works exactly like the punched rolls that work uh, an automatic piano player. Or no, look, this software works in exactly the same way as a musical recording. Uh, and you, you see a lot of uh, amicus briefs and a lot of testimony just saying software is not a unique technology. This is, these are all the uh, equivalents that we've had over time. So you see people thinking about music, thinking about looming, thinking about pretty much anything. Uh, yeah. And so it's going to take you a little different direction. You won't be surprised by what I'm going to say, which is I'm really intrigued by the ecosystem of people and place. And I was struck because there's this great story in Albuquerque, right, of this sort of rise of the virtual theater. And there's an excellent exhibit, if you haven't seen it, New Mexico Natural History Museum of all places, mm -hmm. called Startup, the Personal Revolution Computer in Albuquerque. And it is great. It has probably the best um, object theater I've ever seen where it uses Computer, these early computers as um, essentially actors in a play, and they'll light up and they'll talk, 
there's video in the background, and they use first person narratives and oral histories and photos and stuff about Albuquerque. But I think it's interesting that a lot of people you talk about, of course, and where it really takes off is in the Bay Area and the Bay Area and all that. So I was wondering if you could talk to a little bit about how much of it is not just you know the back and forth between the people, but actually living in the same place and sharing the ideas and and sort of maybe why did Albuquerque sort of go to the wayside and it all become this very I mean the van right from from there goes to Silicon Valley and gets you know mm. run over like some sort of rock star. <laughs> <laughs> It, it is a rock star yeah, buzz. I, I was, I, I freaked out when I saw a picture. I was like, oh, that's the van. It's wonderful. Um, what is it about the place? Uh, I guess that, that goes in part to what Drew had asked about sort of what social, cultural, political, technological contexts might have informed the way that these people thought about their machines. Um, I haven't yet looked at how this story would appear if I were looking at Boston, for example. Um, but I would guess, yeah, I, I would guess that that you know the 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 culture of open sharing and sort of the strong countercultural impulse that you found at pl places like Berkeley were the main shapers. If you look at oral histories uh, with some of the people I talked about, they were saying I was drawn to California because I felt that where I was living was not countercultural enough, and that's why I went there. Um, but I would be very curious. Uh, I, for my dissertation, I don't need to look at other places and to see this story in other places, but I would be very curious to see how this story would compare. For example, following Annalisa Xenian's route in Route 128, how did they think about these relationships there? Yeah. yeah. Well, the Society for the History of Technology is meeting this year. It's in Albuquerque. So I'll stop by the museum and report back. <laughs> yeah. One thing I um, was thinking when you were talking about, you know, hobbyists, how, how much this from today or like from the past 10 years or really all points of our life, I think you talk about intangible property or stuff like that, really intangible makes it difficult for users to, you know, to think that it's worth paying for. You know, I mean, the hardware you should pay for, software you shouldn't. Like, app today, like, you know, you would, oh, it's free, final download, it's not uh, five bucks, uh, I don't think I'll pay for it. And you go back to Napster, you know, people steal music, and is there, is there something basic about us, I guess, is there something you can trace back to, like, the notion that it's not tangible, then it's not worth paying for, or it's not, you know, it's not property or something like that? So if you look at just the history of copyright way past what I'm talking about, so we're looking previous, previous centuries, back to the Statute of Anne, you, you, you have this, these ideas, what are you actually protecting? Are you protecting the book? or that the press just released, or are you protecting the words in the book? And in different regimes of intellectual property, you see disagreement about whether what's protected is the book itself or the words in the book. So perhaps there's something about information versus object, sort of this understated duality that people take for granted when they make these judgments. Uh, but that's a, that's a tough question. I, I would love for someone to write a book about that. Do you want to do it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is an observation, and I mean, I don't know this academic literature, maybe people have written about this already, but in the uh, public note to Bill Gates from Michael Hayes, where he's uh, excoriating him for underpricing his product, and then pitches a model and says, you know, you should either low price mass volume or high price and embed it in the machine. He's basically predicting and describing the future of Microsoft versus Apple, right? Because Apple software is embedded in the machine and priced high. It's kind of and it does not open to tinkering. So, does is there any indication that Steve Jobs becomes aware of this? That you know, there's because it's, I mean, in my mind, this is a pretty prescient statement of how things unfolded significantly later. Do we know if there's actual any tie, or if it just kind of played out that way through happenstance? I wish.
wish I could ask Steve Jobs. Um, I would say certainly, you know, these periodicals were in the hands of basically every hobbyist, so perhaps he read it. I don't know how much of Hayes's particular ideas Jobs might have taken, uh, but I love this quote also in the same paragraph. You had better stop writing code for a minute and think a little harder about your market and how you're going to sell it. Um, because that sort of hard sell drive was one of the most prominent features of most software firms in the early 80s. So uh, there, there is an, I, I wish I could track down these people and then ask them, hey, what did you think when Michael Hayes wrote that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Again, thinking about, you know, Gates or, you know, you get a piece of Microsoft software today, you load it up and then it says, you know, flip the thing over and you have to enter in the 25 digit key or whatever, right? And so there's actually a technological fix to the problem of piracy, right? So Gates writes his letter and he says, you know, He's, he's actually appealing to their sense of morality or something like that. You know, you shouldn't steal my software, you should pay me, right? But in the end, it's a technological fix, right? And so I'm curious if that was ever discussed this early, like in 1975, with people saying, oh, well, we can just put a little, you know, code in there. You know, is, is there a tech fix discussed this early? No. No tech fix discussed this early. Um, and the history of the tech fixes is actually one of the revisions that I want to add when I turn my dissertation into a book. There's some fabulous one, especially for, for uh, games, where with the game came, say, like a little wheel with moving parts, and then the game would ask you, if you move part one to the picture of the happy face, what number shows up next to the heart? And then you have to actually move, move the pieces of paper and arrange them in order to get the code that they wanted. So these tech fixes, I haven't done the full research yet, but they started as sort of giving, a, a, creating a, a, a wall against piracy through the documentation for the programs. So then the programs would ask you for information that the document attached to them had. So what word is on the fifth line of page 27 uh, or something like that. And then they started moving towards these, these more complicated paper-based ones. Uh, and then, uh, then you see what the, the, the sort of number-based ones that you see now. But uh, that's that's a great provision that I want to do. Maybe I can come back to some of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there any documentation that feels like, OK, you know, we're just going to ship our tactics here rather than going direct to market. We're going to, you know, you know, force it on everybody, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> So they're taking it to the manufacturer. Those are uh, easier to sue, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I was just going to ask, um, you know, when you finish the dissertation and you get the book published with whichever press you want, and I'm sure that's going to happen, when, the, when we finish reading the book, are we going to here, are, are we going to get from you a moral to this story? Or are we going to get a take that Know, that you think technology ought to be free, or you know, what, what is, is there something that, uh, that you've gotten out of this or that you plan to inject into the book that's part of your worldview? That's a question I think about a lot, uh, especially when I do my oral histories. And what I, what I tell the people when I interview them is the attitude that I have towards the book. And it's my job here is not to sway the narrative one way or the other. I'm not here to make a legal argument or a moral one. I'm here just to understand how it is that we got in this very messy situation. Uh, if you think about the legal puzzles of software patenting today, they involve everything from how Amazon sells its things to how medical firms try to patent their equipment. All, all these things have become entangled in this web of software patenting. And the creation of that web, studying that, uh, and finding its historiographical significance, that's my place. I don't see my place as giving a moral to the story. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.